Hello, Helen. <clears throat> Hi, Tom. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Are you back in Canada? Uh, not yet. Um, okay. uh, planning to be back um, probably towards the end of April. Ah, okay. So, um, yes. Look forward to seeing you again. <laughs> Indeed, yes. It's been a strange year, but um, looking forward to uh, getting out and about a bit more as the, as the year progresses. Right. Aren't we all? Yeah. So maybe I'll just get started. Um, I was thinking this would be a relatively informal meeting, but I did want to give everyone a bit of context. Um, so welcome to our very first meeting. Uh, it's the Lake Futures Steering Committee presentation series, and it's hosted by the Lake Futures Project, which is all about adaptive watershed and lake management solutions that minimize those trade-offs between lake ecosystems and water uses and economic growth. My name is Nancy Goshi. I'm the Knowledge Mobilization Specialist at the University of Waterloo. I support the Global Water Futures Program, and this means that I'm working to help make sure that the research we do at the university has a positive impact on the policies and programs and tools that are being created to help uh, water managers. So we're here. This, this, these meetings were originally planned to be pretty small. Uh, but we found that there was lots of people interested, so we extended the invite to a few other people, including the um, colleagues of the members of our steering committee from their organizations, um, as well as some other researchers from research groups that are doing kind of similar work. Um, the idea for this series came from our steering committee members themselves. We had a, our very first meeting back in November, and um, if some of you might recall, Lake Futures did a webinar series in the summer where we got to present our research findings. And the committee said, hey, what about us? Can we share some of the things that we're doing as well? And we thought that this was a really great opportunity. And so we have three um, members of our steering committee who have volunteered to do presentations for us. We're very, very grateful for that. And Tom is brave enough to lead us off. Um, so just so you know, we also have Mel Loomis, she's going to join us on April 30th, and um, Sandy George and Ram Urbandi from Environment and Climate Change Canada are scheduled on April 14th. So uh, please, everyone, you are also invited to those other two meetings. So the goal, um, our goals today is really just to promote networking and relationship building between uh, the researchers and the partners and stakeholders. We're also looking for mutual learning. Um, like I said, we want to, it's, it's really hard to stay on top of all of the work that is happening, um, especially if you're going to just try to rely on what's been formally written up. So this gives us a chance to kind of maybe get a, a head start and learn uh, about things before they're formally presented in journal articles or conferences. And then I think the other really important goal here is to look for those alignment opportunities and collaboration. Um, and, you know, when we're working together, we can achieve more together. And so uh, you can't do that unless you know what each other is working on. We might, you know, met, learn something that we could tweak what we're doing or, uh, you know, in order to make the work that we're doing more useful. So the format is Tom's going to give about a 30 minute talk. Uh, for that talk, we'd ask that people mute themselves and turn off their cameras just to keep bandwidth um, running smoothly. And then we're going to open up the floor for Q&A. So if you have questions, please add them to the chat box. We might just wait till Tom's done speaking in order to ask those. And, um, or if you want, you can also raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can ask your question um, vocally. And then we're also going to reserve the last bit of the hour for a discussion specifically about how some of this might translate or be useful to the Lake Futures Project. So if you're not uh, a part of the Lake Futures research team or the steering committee, you can feel free to log off at that point. You don't have to feel free to join us. It's not a, a secret discussion. Uh, we just wanted to reserve a bit of time to, to really kind of zoom in and focus on, on implications for the project. So I will um, introduce Tom and then hand it over to him. So since July 2019, Tom uh, Rosama has been a chief scientist with Plant Nutrition Canada. He's been involved in developing the famous 4R certification program in both the US and Canada. And he's been recognized as a fellow of the American Society of Agronomy 
the Soil Science Society of America and the Canadian Science of America. He's an education bachelor's uh, in, from the University of Guelph in agriculture and a master's from Guelph in crop science and a PhD from Cornell in, in soil science. So I think that is it. Tom, you can take it from here. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Uh, can you confirm that you uh, hear me? We can hear you, we can see you, and we can see your slides. Thanks, Nancy, for the introduction, and Nancy and Nadita for the invitation to, to speak here. Uh, I, I hope, um, I, I'm very interested to hear uh, some of your reactions to this. What you'll get, I guess, is the, the perspective of someone with an agronomy background who's employed by the fertilizer industry. Uh, that kind of person's perspective on what is responsible plant nutrition and how does it relate to water quality. And I think my talk is going, if there's, there's possibly two divisions in it, first few slides are going to be a little bit institutional in nature and give you a bit of history of the different organizations with which I have worked and which I continue to uh, work with. Uh, and in the second part of the presentation, I will present some data as we see it, nutrient flows on a, on a cropping systems perspective, uh, which, uh, which, which hopefully will tie in to uh, what you're doing, as particularly on water quality programs. So I'm speaking to you from Guelph, Ontario, Canada, and uh, the organization I work for is Plant Nutrition Canada. It is sort of a descendant of the International Plant Nutrition Institute. And the, we just, um, this is a brand new website, actually. Um, I scrolled, I put the uh, URL right across the, uh, the page here. Essentially, what Plant Nutrition Canada does is provide science support for the fertilizer industry's efforts to advance nutrient stewardship. We apply science, we interpret science, and extend science for sustainable plant nutrition. Uh, this website, if you go there, it links to a lot of the historic resources that were provided by the International Plant Nutrition Institute, uh, a much larger organization that uh, unfortunately uh, ceased to exist in uh, 2019. Uh, when I worked for that organization, I had many colleagues around the world and uh, it was uh, quite an experience to, uh, to share um, uh, scientific information from so many different cropping systems, from so many different cultural perspectives as well. Nevertheless, that's gone and what you'll hear, uh, everyone who, with whom I was uh, employed I still have a, a lot of contact with, and, uh, and they are, a lot of them are still engaged in uh, the uh, agricultural um, uh, industries. Um, IPNI was an organization that produced a periodical called Better Crops with Plant Food, uh, four issues per year, dating back to 1927 or so. And so it, it's, uh, it's quite a history uh, just recently. Uh, I was asked by the Soil and Water Conservation Society to do uh, an article uh, for their 75th anniversary uh, just last year. And so we dipped back to 1945 and I read through the entire issue or a set of issues for that year. And to my surprise, I found that back in 1945, there was an article that talked about applying the right source of fertilizer at the right rate at the right time and in the right place. So it turned out the 4R concept was older than we thought it was. Today, the resources that uh, IPNI uh, used to provide are made available through uh, the Fertilizer Institute. Uh, there is a, a thing they call the store, store.tfi.org. And so things like the Plant Nutrition Manual, uh, several manuals for soil fertility, for uh, the Certified Crop Advisor Program are, are still available there uh, for industry support and, uh, and open to anyone, in fact. Plant Nutrition Canada's direct role is in supporting the uh, programs of Fertilizer Canada, the Fertilizer Institute for the US, and for the International Fertilizer Association based in Paris. And its partners include the African Plant Nutrition Institute, uh, a new uh, organization where a good number of my um, colleagues from the States uh, ended up, uh, based in uh, near Marrakesh. 
I also uh, chair a scientific panel on responsible uh, plant nutrition that is supported by EFA, the International Fertilizer Association. And uh, that panel, I'll talk a little bit about one of its first products uh, uh, just shortly. Fertilizer Canada has a project they call For Our Solution, Canada Africa For Our Solution, and it links us to uh, specific um, uh, organizations, uh, including the Cooperative Development Foundation, uh, based, uh, and it's based in uh, <clears throat> Ethiopia, in Ghana, and uh, in Senegal. And the program there aims to use uh, For Our um, management solutions uh, utilizing for smallholder farmers to utilize fertilizer to improve their their livelihoods. And lastly, I serve as the uh, chair of the technical advisory group for the industries for our research fund. And you'll see some examples of projects uh, uh, supported by that fund as well. Uh, first, uh, a broad overview uh, slide of um, how I've looked at for our nutrient stewardship. Uh, a lot can be read into uh, this um, diagram. Uh, I often call it for our oval. It puts uh, source rate, time and place right in the center of everything. And you can see, of course, that's a fertilizer centric perspective. Nevertheless, uh, the management of fertilizer has impacts on um, all three legs of sustainability. And this list of nine um, impacts, sometimes I've called them metrics, sometimes we've called them indicators, uh, they're really areas of impact. And they range from ones that affect the farm level, uh, crop yields, obviously, uh, soil health, particularly the fertility component, nutrient use efficiency, those, all, those three are metrics that have a lot of meaning to the farmer because they relate very directly to the profitability of fertilizer use. When we talk about phosphorus, the, I usually end up talking about the first three and then water quality as well, and it's the, the intent of the talk today. Uh, when we uh, start including nitrogen, then uh, we uh, oh, then we go a little further and uh, talk about some fairly direct impacts on air quality, greenhouse gases, and potentially biodiversity as well. And the whole combination has uh, impacts on something we call macroeconomic value. I uh, haven't got a lot of definition for it as yet, but. Uh, a commonly cited figure is that fertilizer use is responsible for feeding, uh, pre producing pretty well 50% of the, the global food supply at this point. And so that, that, that yield increase is not just value to the farmer, it's value through the whole economy uh, of, of, uh, of livelihoods for people involved in the various industries that, that transform those foods. And then of course, food security is the, is the bottom line. Uh, these last three are pretty difficult to relate to the farm level, but at the same time, uh, it's part of the scope of what we call for our nutrient stewardship. Now, it's a wonderful list, and we like to think that, oh, yes, we can control it all through the four R's, but of course, not one of these nine impact areas is affected by only fertilizer. Uh, all of this is conditional on good management of the cropping system. And that's where this figure starts to get a lot more complicated if you try to bring everything in in specific and in balance. If we look at crop management, uh, it's often divided into four categories as well, where the four R's becomes just one of the four, the nutrient management component. There is still crop management, there's pest management, and there's soil and water management. Uh, and those are, that's essentially the domain of the certified crop advisor. So I, I sketched them out here in this diagram with the immediate impacts, uh, labeling them economic, uh, greenhouse gases, water quality, air quality, looking at them as environmental impacts, and then the broader impacts, uh, put it into the social category. Uh, this diagram uh, put together at one point to show all this, but uh, haven't used it a whole lot because of its complexity. Nevertheless, um, I thought for the audience today, for the issues that you're dealing with in the water quality program, I think uh, this is an appropriate diagram. The outcomes of 4R nutrient stewardship are influenced by so many other things, crop and pest management, by soil and water conservation practices in the change, context of changing weather and climate. 
And so um, I think that's, that's part, what needs to be part uh, of a, a, a comprehensive program on water for uh, meeting societal needs. So, uh, I, you know, one of the things I'm hoping for feedback on is whether this di diagram has any meaning, for, meaning uh, to you uh, or um, a little bit more about for our nutrient stewardship. It's recognized in the FAO's code of conduct for uh, sustainable use and management of fertilizers. It's recognized in the emerging and developing uh, Canadian grain farmers code of practice. Uh, where, they're, where the farmers are getting together to define standards for not only nutrient management, but all components of uh, grain production in Canada. Um, in fact, earlier today, I was involved in a two hour conference call, plotting out the strategy for the next steps in the development of that particular code of practice. A few words about the scientific panel on responsible plant nutrition. This is a grouping of uh, 11 scientists from around the world with a very broad range of disciplines. Uh, and they're trying, uh, what we're trying to do there is put out um, issue papers, uh, reviewing uh, various issues that are related to uh, what we call responsible plant nutrition, probably a broader sphere of nutrients in agriculture than is represented by for our nutrient stewardship. Um, and in fact, the way we define our new paradigm is that we're uh, not only dealing with the impacts of nutrient management on income, productivity, efficiency, and resilience, but we're also dealing with uh, uh, waste and recycling, increasing the recycling of materials to, towards a better, uh, cir more circular economy. We're dealing with emissions in the environment, uh, which is where the water quality would fit in. Uh, we're dealing with impacts on human nutrition and health in terms of uh, the role of mineral nutrients uh, influencing the, um, the quality of uh, crops that are produced uh, in terms of human nutrition. And then a, a very large issue nowadays is the whole area of soil health and nutrient flows certainly are a component of that as well. And then we outline six areas of action where in which we expect our industry to take part. We don't believe that all of this can be attained just by the fertilizer industry, but nevertheless, we see the industry getting engaged in sustainability driven policies and business models uh, in a data driven, more precise crop nutrition. Uh, getting involved in nutrient recovery and recycling. And there are good ex examples of that in North America already with uh, Ostara capturing struvite from um, wastewater treatment plants. There's a company called Anuvia making fertilizers out of food waste and then impregnating that into a traditional fertilizer form and having that marketed across uh, North America. Nutrition-sensitive agriculture, uh, ensuring that we're producing crops that have adequate levels uh, to meet human needs for zinc, uh, selenium, and uh, other micronutrients. Low emission fertilizers, where we're trying to reduce the emissions involved uh, in terms of greenhouse gases in the manufacture of nitrogen fertilizer, as well as the emissions associated with uh, use uh, in terms of nitrous oxide emissions. And then accelerated innovation systems uh, that involve the, the whole process, the whole process of supporting um, uh, improvement in, in crop product productivity. So, and the one uh, we have uh, envisioned six different outcomes there. And the one that relates most to water quality is that through responsible consumption, through increased recycling and through better management practices, we envision nutrient waste along the food system has been cut in half and nitrogen, first, nitrogen and phosphorus surpluses in hot spots have been reduced in such a way that we minimize eutrophication and other environmental harm. That's just one outcome of nine. Uh, so you can see the, the challenges facing the plant nutrient in, uh, industry on a global level are, are quite substantial and significant. Just a quick word about the 4R Solution Project. Um, uh, there we had a webinar series and uh, we're engaging scientists from both Canada and uh, also practitioners in uh, challenges involved in implementing 
for our management practices for fertilizer use in Africa. We see Africa as a, con as a continent in which, uh, owing to decades of growing crops with less fertilizer than the crops remove, as a, it's a continent in need of soil replenishment. And so we foresee Africa requiring uh, a tripling of fertilizer use in order to double the crop product productivity to meet the, the needs of its population by the year 2040. I'm going to move now into some of the data that uh, has been developed uh, by industry in cooperation with the government. What I'm showing here is a, a form of nutrient use efficiency trajectory um, that I think is somewhat informative. It's not my favorite form. We'll get to that uh, as we move along here. This one is using data that's been assembled by EFA uh, into a nutrient use efficiency database. And what we plot here uh, is output against input, with output de being defined as the nutrients removed by harvest of arable crops. This includes mostly, uh, especially on the world basis, it's mostly cereal crops. Uh, there's very little in the way of forage crops included. Uh, it's, uh, it's mostly cereals. It does include both legumes and non-legumes. So on the input side, we have fertilizer, we have nitrogen fixation by cultivated legumes, and we also have uh, manure, but it's a, the fraction of manure nitrogen that uh, is estimated to reach the land. And none of those are perfect numbers, but basically a, a great deal of those numbers come from FAO. Uh, the output is calculated using crop nutrient removal coefficients that have been assembled over the years by industry. And when we uh, plot things out this way, um, output against input, there's a, the one-to-one -one line is perfect efficiency, 100%. But we, we see the world's nutrient use efficiency as productivity has increased. We've uh, seen uh, uh, since the early 60s, nutrient use efficiency was getting worse. But now it's starting to curve towards that one-to-one -one line and uh, increasing up to 60%. Now, this is a bit more of an optimistic estimate. There are other published estimates that put it around 50%, uh, but uh, the, the, uh, those estimates as well see a, a recent improvement. Um, ideally, it would be higher than that. So there is definitely room for continued improvement. If we compare uh, the world, uh, when we're looking at the world total inputs of nitrogen, we're looking at almost 150 teragrams uh, compared to 90 teragrams removed by crops. If we look at the USA, it's a fairly similar pattern with a uh, tendency to improve and it's at approximately 72% um, uh, currently. And if we compare that to Canada, Canada started out in a actual nutrient mining uh, situation in the 60s. There was still a lot of summer fallowing going on in the prairie provinces where the annual, the, by uh, occasionally leaving fields to, into a bare fallow, the organic, the rich organic matter in those soils was mineralized and made available to crops, but uh, over time that was depleting the soil organic ma matter reserves. And so currently, uh, our estimates are Canada is at 78%. And the figures I've shown you have, have been actually rather high, but you have to remember that these include legumes and our assumptions for nitrogen fixation is essentially that uh, the legumes we grow, soybeans, um, peanuts, and other pulses that fix nitrogen, that essentially they're fixing exactly as much as we remo remove by harvest. So by definition, their nutrient use efficiency is 100%. And that's averaged into the cereals like wheat and corn, where the nutrient use efficiency is somewhat lower. Here we get to a, a more site-specific and more explicit type of um, uh, nutrient accounting. Uh, this is a product called Nugis, and it was developed by IPNI. And we continue to support it as an industry. Uh, I've been involved uh, in upgrading it over the last year. We make um, the data available for new complete nutrient balances um, <clears throat> uh, and make them available uh, at the county level in the US 
at the watershed level, what we call Hawk 8, the eight digit uh, hydrologic units, and also at the two digit hydrologic units. And so if we're looking at the two digit one, this is what the Great Lakes um, <clears throat> unit looks like. You can see in terms of agricultural area, because the, the white areas here are basically not enough for cropland to consider agricultural. The colored areas, uh, this is where the bulk of the agriculture is, where the crop production is. And the shaded shades in color show in this instance, the watershed nitrogen balance. We have, in, as well as nitrogen, we have uh, phosphorus and potassium. Uh, the green here represents a nitrogen surplus. Yellow to red represents a nitrogen deficit. Uh, you can see a, a surplus of nitrogen in much of the, uh, the Maumee watershed and uh, the lower half of, uh, of Michigan. So uh, this um, product has now got annualized data available from 1987 to 2016. And so for any spatial unit, whether it's a county, um, a HUC2 or a HUC8, we, uh, you can click on the screen and up pops a nutrient balance like this, with the red bars indicating removal in crop harvest. In this instance, it's nitrogen. And the green bars, the different components of inputs, the fertilizer, the manure, and the uh, legume fixation. Uh, some, and st they stack so that you can compare them to crop harvest. And you can see that across the whole time period, continuing into today, there is a surplus relative to crop harvest. Nitrogen is an element that's easily lost by many different pathways, either to the air or to water. And so it's very rare to see uh, nitrogen um, uh, in a, a deficit situation. If that is happening, you can be fairly sure that the crop is actually mining nitrogen from the soil organic matter on a net basis over time. Uh, for the same region, looking at the phosphate balance, we, we see a different situation where <clears throat> The crop removal in 1987 was less than what was being applied. And in fact, if you go back a little further in history, you would see uh, even a larger surplus. Um, and then, <clears throat> uh, but currently uh, in this Great Lakes region, at least, uh, we're seeing generally crops removing more phosphorus than is being replaced in the fertilizer and the manure that's actually applied to the land. Uh, I will emphasize that this manure is not all the manure excreted by animals, but, but we'd use uh, estimates provided from the uh, USDA NRCS uh, about losses of manure and recoverability of manure to make an estimate of what's actually applied to the land. Similar methods used uh, in the prairie provinces. I have these for Canada up to 2013 uh, and recently updated in a crude way the ones for the prairie provinces since we had a water quality uh, workshop this past winter um, for the prairies. I did it with a crude assumption that nothing changed in manure since 2013. Uh, that's not actually quite correct. So the, the manure may be a larger fraction than that. Uh, because there may have been changes in the uh, animal industry as well. But the, uh, the important point here is that in the Canadian prairies, we've seen a steep increase in phosphorus fertilizer use as well as nitrogen fertilizer use, but it's been associated with a steep increase as well in crop removal as both yields and overall production of canola and wheat have increased. And so in the prairies, we're actually often finding that the recoverable manure plus fertilizer uh, does not uh, sum up to as large a number as the crop removal. And so the, the prairies are often in deficit. And this is quite a contrast if you compare it to some other regions. Uh, a paper I was involved in recently, we uh, did some comparisons of data actually assembled from other papers uh, by groups in uh, Wageningen University. And <clears throat> in those uh, data sets, if you plotted the fertilizer, and actually this fertilizer line is, is total nutrients, it's uh, stacked on top of the manure, so it's a total nutrient input so that you can compare it to crop uh, removal. So the space between the crop removal line and the blue line is the surplus. And you can see it for Western Europe. You can see it for uh, the USA. If you sum that cumulative surplus, it amounts to 51 years of 
of the current crop removal of phosphorus for Western Europe, 16 years for the US. The cumulative sur phosphorus surplus amounts to 51 years of crop removal in Western Europe. 16 years in the US, that's quite a contrast if you're looking at the prairie provinces. Uh, to my knowledge, even previous to 1975, there was never really a phosphorus surplus on those agricultural lands. So those agricultural soils likely differ considerably from the cropland of Europe, from the cropland of uh, some of the more intensive parts of the United States. If we uh, use a fairly similar approach to look at Ontario, um, my best guess is that the figure is quite similar to the USA on average. There was a period of high inputs of fertilizer to build up the phosphorus fertility in the soils. And so the cumulative surplus amounts to approximately 14 years of crop removal in Ontario. <clears throat> so those are things to keep in mind. Um, it's not a drastic situation necessarily because that, that, uh, that cumulative surplus built up in the soil has improved the fertility so that farmers have been able to reduce rates. Uh, and <clears throat> even though they have increased again recently, I think there, there may be opportunities uh, for reduction, but at the same time, we have to recognize that whenever the crops are removing more than is being replaced, the soil, the soil fertility levels will de decline as well. So it's a significant amount of uh, phosphorus per cropland acre that, that is accumulated in these soils and is a resource for crop production. Uh, <clears throat> these kind of balances feed into work. Uh, the, this uh, excellent paper by Helen Jarvie, um, in which I was involved uh, through the use of NUGIS data, basically showed that uh, over the period from 1987 through 2014, if we look at that Western Lake Erie watershed, the cropland phosphorus use efficiency almost doubled, yet the loss of dissolved phosphorus to the lake also doubled. <clears throat> and, it's not the, and it's not the total phosphorus, it's the dissolved phosphorus. So the, the inputs in fertilizer and manure changed very little, but the, the crop, uh, crop use uh, grew considerably over time. And the, one of the, the, con the, the conclusions of this paper point out that it's, it's fairly hard to put your finger on the actual cause, but one of the uh, causes was an unintended consequence of uh, conservation tillage with broadcast application of phosphorus fertilizer. And hence the, the need for a 4R program focused on um, getting phosphorus fertilizer to the crop at the right time and in the right place, particularly the right place, not leaving it on the soil surface. And that's something we're still working at uh, through the 4R program uh, in that watershed. I wanted to uh, point out as well, the, um, uh, another project I'm involved with is summarizing the soil test levels across North America. This project as well is supported by the Fertilizer Institute. And uh, we are about to release the 2020 version. Data is available up to 2015 uh, for most of these elements. The one element that we've added um, is in um, 2020 is soil organic matter. This, these are summaries of the actual samples that farmers submit to soil test laboratories for their recommendations. So that you have to keep in, that in mind when you're interpreting these. This is not the total quantity of phosphorus in the soil. It's not the total quantity even in the, the part that's sampled, which is typically the top 15 centimeters or so, 15 or 20 centimeters of soil. And uh, so particularly when you look at the soil organic matter, you, you need to interpret it carefully. Uh, this isn't uh, su uh, sufficiently precise to uh, estimate soil carbon storage. But nevertheless, it's a summary that involves, um, in fact, in the last year, we're up to 7.7 .7 million samples across North America. So uh, the, the, in terms of numbers of samples, it's very powerful for identifying trends. And if we look at this figure, you can see uh, we've, we've done this uh, survey systematically since 2001. Uh, where we had 2 million samples, uh, 2005, uh, 2010, 2015 again, we've grown up to 7.7 .7 million samples. These are not necessarily all the samples taken across North America, but they're the, 
they're probably approximately 75 percent. Uh, we get great participation, but not all laboratories can uh, contribute data to this uh, survey. Here we plot this out as a Bray and P Kurtz P1 equivalent soil test level. There are equivalency tables provided in the, uh, in the reports that we have. Be, and that's very important when you're looking at soil test phosphorus because the different extractants for soil test phosphorus produce numbers that have very different ranges. Uh, they're all meaningful, but they have to be interpreted by, the, by their specific calibration to crop response. Typically for a Bray and Kurtz, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we expect about um, a, a, a critical level of 20, that below 20 uh, or so, uh, 15 or 20, we expect um, a, a greater than 50% chance that the crop will yield less if it's not fertilized with phosphorus. Above that level, some farmers continue to fertilize, mostly to replenish the nutrients taken out of, their, uh, uh, of the soil by their crops. So uh, some data that may be of interest uh, in Ontario, looking at it um, in these three categories, which I consider that, you know, Below 25, farmers will want to be building up towards a 25 or so. Um, and then there's a more intermediate level, and then, then there's a level that's probably higher than is necessary agronomically. And the, the data show that over time in Ontario, <clears throat> uh, the fraction testing lower in phosphorus is increasing. The fraction in the middle is staying about the same, and the fraction testing higher than it needs to has been coming down somewhat. If you compare that to Ohio, um, Ohio is an agricultural economy that has more crops, less livestock, and tends to have lower soil uh, phosphorus levels. Uh, we see there the same trend of soils that are lower in phosphorus, they are increasing in frequency. Soil tests uh, higher in phos phosphorus are declining in frequency. Canadian prairies, in the prairie provinces, we see the lowest uh, soil test phosphorus of all. Uh, there too, um, uh, phosphorus uh, levels are slowly moving upwards uh, over time uh, through cultivation. And the, the number of samples collected across the prairie provinces is also increasing over time. The industry supports uh, in Canada a 4R fertilizer use survey and uh, it's been doing this since 2016 and up to 2020, um, focused on the key crops for Ontario and Western Canada. Corn and soybeans in Ontario, canola and wheat in Western Canada. Um, it gets into extreme excruciating detail on the sources, rates, times, and places of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur applied. And uh, if you wanna think of this like a scientist, think of an interaction, a four-way interaction times a four-way interaction. That's the level of detail. Each one of these surveys it comes out with hundreds of slides uh, breaking down the aspects of uh, fertilizer application for each of the different crops. Um, what we find uh, are some, some very encouraging numbers, like in the Canadian prairies, 95% of fertilizer phosphorus is applied subsurface. The <clears throat> so here's an example of uh, just a partial uh, look at some of this data for nitrogen placement, phosphorus placement, potassium placement, and sulfur. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, fertilizer placement in corn. It's, most, it's for Ontario. Uh, what we're seeing is most of the phosphorus for corn is going on side plant, banded at planting. That's the most frequent approach, 43%. Um, <clears throat> we see a considerable amount put on in the spring, followed by incorporation. Only if small fractions of phosphorus are applied without uh, incorporation in the province of Ontario. And the same goes uh, for nitrogen. The nitrogen, the issue is if urea is left on the surface, uh, ammonia volatilization can be an issue. Um, and for phosphorus left on the surface, uh, uh, increasing the uh, dissolved, uh, the, the concentration of dissolved phosphorus in runoff is a consequence if, it, if it's not placed deep. 
uh, approaches used uh, are, are summarized as well. And uh, we would like to see higher numbers for uh, farmers who base the decision for, not, for phosphorus and potassium particularly on, on a soil test report. Uh, but there are many other sources of information that they consider as well. Um, this is use of enhanced efficiency fertilizers, mostly nitrogen. Uh, the blue is uh, ESN, which is a polymer coated urea. The super U is urea that has both a urease inhibitor and a nitrification inhibitor embedded, uh, which can have a dramatic uh, impact on loss of nitrous oxide and also some impact in improving the use efficiency of the fertilizer. And then there's a number of other uh, nitrogen stabilizers applied as well. You can see this is, does not apply to the majority of fertilizers as yet, but there's a growing and significant fraction of growers who are using uh, fertilizers that have been modified to uh, enhance the efficiency of uptake and reduce losses. Uh, just a few words about the 4R Nutrient Steward Stewardship Certification Program um, kicked off in Ohio. Uh, I think uh, efforts to develop it began before 2000, around 2012, and the program was rolled out in 2014. Uh, by 2018, it had been extended to Ontario as well, and we have uh, uh, quite a considerable number of well, hundreds of thousands of acres are now um, influenced by retailers who are third-party certified in 4R nutrient stewardship, meaning that there's a set of criteria on that they uh, have to verify to a third party uh, in, in order to maintain that accreditation. Um, it's, a, it's a program that involves collaboration, uh, the collaboration of Grain Farmers of Ontario, Conservation Ontario, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture and uh, Christian Farmers, farmer organizations all work together on this with the fertilizer industry similar to the program in Ohio where uh, the Nature Conservancy, the government agencies uh, were all partners in the program to define the criteria. And uh, the, the most useful slogan there is turning industry's uh, attitude from being defensive about nutrient losses to a collaborative attitude where the slogan for the program became, we all play a role. <clears throat> There's growing interest in 4R certification. It's fairly onerous. It's a lot of cost to the dealer and the only benefit is recognition. Uh, so, so far in third party certification, we have Ontario, New York and Ohio. Um, there are designation programs in uh, across Western Canada and uh, a growing number of states are interested in that as well. For our research fund has supported a number of projects. This is, an, this is uh, Kevin King uh, giving a, a lecture um, on a field trip uh, where we're looking at one of the uh, edge of field uh, monitoring installations. Uh, these are extremely useful because there's so many um, intricacies involved in the relationship of how we manage the nutrients and how we manage tillage and crops and the results in terms of actual uh, losses of phosphorus that delivered to Lake Erie. And this project uh, continues to monitor a number of fields, even though formally the project has uh, uh, been completed. It's generated a great number of publications, um, many of them highlighting uh, just uh, how much dissolved phosphorus increases uh, when uh, phosphorus is left on the surface. Uh, that project is still delivering about a million per year uh, to research projects in the US uh, and in Canada as well. Um, it is due to be wrapped up in 2022. Um, um, we're hopeful uh, of some renewal, but it's not uh, assured at this point. So in summary, uh, the fertilizer industry is seeking to advance nutrient stewardship through support for its various institutions, Plant Nutrition Canada, Fertilizer Canada, TFI. Um, all, of my, uh, all of the support for Plant Nutrition Canada is, is derived from the industry uh, through Foundation for Agronomic Research, through the 4R Research Fund, uh, 4R Solution Project. That one certainly has a, a large component of Canadian government financing as well. Uh, IFA and the Scientific Panel on Responsible Plant Nutrition as well are um, industry supported. Um, soil test, 
nutrient balance for our practice survey data, I think are the essential things that we as an industry uh, can help provide information on. And I believe that this, important, uh, this information is important for informing policy on how changes to management, changes to forearm management, and also ch changes to other crop management practices um, can be effective in reducing nutrient loads to water. And so I invite your co collaboration um, in the continuing ev evolution of for our nutrient stewardship. At this point, I'll stop and I'd be happy to entertain any uh, questions. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Tom, very much. I was madly scribbling some notes and I imagine others are, are keen as well. Does anyone have any questions? I'm not sure you can not sure how to raise your hand. Maybe you can just. There is a way to raise your hands, but otherwise, if you have questions, maybe just chime in or, or, uh, or if you just put something in the chat box, we can call on you. I have a ton of questions, but I'm holding it back. This is a fascinating talk, Tom. Okay, I'm going to jump right in and ask my question. And if by that time somebody comes up with a question, feel free to raise your hand. Um, Tom, that was a really, really interesting talk. I really love the way you went through the different scales. So macro scale, countrywide assessments of nutrient balance to add the field scale assessment of, uh, of uh, phosphorus levels uh, to farmer surveys. Um, one of my question was about the soil test phosphorus data, which was fascinating. Uh, and my question was about the distributions of the data as uh, um, not, so you showed the mean across Ontario. And for example, if you look at the above 50 category, you can see that you are drawing down phosphorus really uh, in the above 50 category, which is where we should be. Uh, my question was uh, that bar uh, is, uh, is a mean of 700,000 farm level data points. Uh, and uh, have you also looked at the distribution of the data and tried to kind of ascertain what controls those levels? Is it land use, topography, practices? And is there a linkage between the other part of your work, which is the fertilizer use survey and those soil test p-value? Like that's good behavior on the part of the farmer translate to different soil test numbers. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, Nandita. I, I, your question has a couple of components in there. Um, and yes, in the simplest categorization, I just had three categories. And those were those bars, to clarify, were the, the frequency, the relative frequency in terms of percent of soils testing above those, those different lines within those the different categories. None of them were means. Uh, we never take okay. averages of a soil test level because soil test data is not normally distributed. Uh, so we do present medians. Uh, I like the simple three categories because a soil test is not a very precise instrument. It's, 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 a, it's a useful instrument. It's accurate for guiding uh, fertilizer um, uh, strategies, but it's not a, a fertilizer, a soil test does not precisely determine what you apply for your crop. And so the, when I broke it down into three categories, I, I was thinking more along the lines for a farmer. If you're in the lowest category, apply a little more than crop removal to keep your, build up your soil fertility. If you're in the middle, maintain your soil fertility. If you're uh, on the high end, make sure you're depleting your, uh, drawing down on that soil fertility as a resource. That's the simple message from it. We do have the data available. Uh, we ask for it in much finer categories, all the way up to 500 parts per million on a Bray uh, P1, P1 equivalent. Uh, so we have, uh, in fact, 15 bins for the uh, actual data the way it comes in. We have never made public, um, like we've, we usually stop at 50 and above. <clears throat> okay. Um, when you get to sharing the data that's 50 and above, it becomes a little bit sensitive for um, livestock producers who are in a situation where owing to not only their own um, decisions, but also to uh, government programs, have been put in a situation where they have more phosphorus than they can actually, uh, you know, remove from their land with crops. 
And, and so though the situation there is uh, some farmers have very high levels, um, they don't necessarily like being singled out. So when it comes to the individual level, um, from the industry standpoint, we can put out our recommendations as what we recommend you do uh, given a soil test level, um, but we can't, we don't control the use. The control, you know, the, the decision is up to uh, the farmer as to uh, what amount to apply. That sounds but I hope that's captured everything you were looking no, no, for. No, that, no, that is, <laughs> that, yes, yeah, so that is kind of related to, yeah, so, so thank you for that response. Uh, is it possible, I mean, I, I totally understand uh, the nuance about the individual farmers and, and, and uh, um, privacy of that data set. Um, but in terms of broader kind of recommendations, is it possible to say things like you said right now that possibly it is the livestock density that's causing the higher values in a way to move management in a place where we can address some of those challenges? I would think that the combination of the soil test data and uh, nutrient balance data is what's needed to help guide those kind of decisions. It is important to avoid uh, overgeneralizing as well, because it's not only um, uh, livestock. Uh, potato growers, for example, potato soils, tobacco soils, um, vegetable soils tend to be higher in phosphorus as well, because those crops have higher phosphorus requirements and traditionally are fertilized at rates that are higher than crop removal. So I, I'm not trying to say it's all manure. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's right. uh, there, there, there are soils that are built up with fertilizer as well, and each each of those situations uh, can can be considered unique. You know, a lot of the tobacco soils, for example, may be very high in phosphorus, but those are very well drained soils, generating very little run runoff. And and a follow up to that. Um, do you think that the guys with nutrient, the farmers with nutrient management plans are the ones that will more likely be getting the regular soil testing? And is it actually, we are actually getting weighting of, of manure using farmers in your database more than just the cash croppers? That's a great question, Mel. Um, we get asked that quite a bit, you know, yeah. uh, some people figuring that uh, our, uh, our survey is biased because regulations require certain farmers to test. Yeah. Others come to us and say, well, you know, the farmer that has very high soil test levels, they may be embarrassed about it and they may be reluctant to send it to the lab unless they're compelled to. Because not every life, you know, life, not every farmer with high phosphorus soils is necessarily regulated to uh, send phosphorus samples every exactly. so often. I look at it as at it as the fact that we're capturing a very large number. It's not quite a census, but it's certainly mm -hmm. a survey with a very large representation of the population. So. I don't say it's perfect data. Uh, it, it certainly isn't perfect, but it, I think it's a fairly good reflection of what's out there and useful for comparison one jur comparing one jurisdiction to another. And uh, the trends over time prove somewhat interesting as well. Okay. Other questions? Feel free to chime in, jump in. It's pretty informal. I have a question. I mean, uh... Yeah, first of all, <clears throat> was, this was a great talk. I uh, also liked the, uh, that you produced all the, you showed all these websites where all this data is available. Uh, that's, of course, very useful. Just in general, you, you showed these nutrient um, efficiency or use efficiency graphs for the world, for different uh, continents, and also different province, the different provinces and, and states. So in general, would you say that, the, uh, that these changes in use efficiency over time are mostly due to changes in the crops we're growing, or is it mostly, uh, application of the nutrients or, or tillage, or, or are they equally responsible for these changes? Uh, that is a great question, Philippe. You know, what is responsible for the increase in, in nutrient use efficiency over time? And I don't think that we uh, in the fertilizer industry can take complete credit for it. Um, certainly, um, we like to believe that uh, fertilizer management, that uh, we're getting closer to the right source, the right rate, right time, right place, mm -hmm. and that's making some improvements and contributions to nutrient use efficiency. But the nutrient use efficiency metric has a, a numerator and a denominator, and fertilizer is just the denominator part. Uh, the numerator is crop yield. 
So everything that farmers do to improve their yields also improves nutrient use efficiency, as long as it doesn't involve increasing the fertilizer input more than increasing the yield. So uh, uh, genetic improvement, improvements in crop management, um, there are even some trade-offs. Like uh, when, I, when I talk about you know, insisting that farmers um, place their phosphorus in the Lake Erie watershed, it's quite clear that it takes much longer to apply the phosphorus uh, when you're put it, putting it subsurface than mm. with the technology they have available for broadcasting. Broadcasting is very fast, efficient and cheap and very timely and helps them get the crop planted on time. A lot of their no-till has a lot of advantages and conservation tillage I'm highly supportive of. But if you're a no-till farmer, uh, you find this message of put the phosphorus subsurface to be quite um, onerous. Hmm. A lot of them like to find ways of, can we find a right time solution instead? And I'm not sure that we can, um, but at the same time, uh, it, it's much more difficult for the no-till farmer to do uh, the placement that we would like to see than it is for um, a, a regular tillage farmer. <clears throat> Thank you. I have a question on the chat from Jian Liu. Um, hi, Tom, I have a question about non-recoverable manure that you showed in one of the figures. It looks uh, like a lot of manure. I guess it is mostly found on pasture land. Do you have any comments on the risks of that portion of the manure on water quality? That's an excellent question, uh, Jian. Um, the, uh, the, the manure, yes, has recoverable component and a non-recoverable component. Um, in Nugis and most of our products, we emphasize the recoverable part because uh, to our, the best of our knowledge, this is what's applied to land. This is the nutrient content of the manure when it's applied to the land. We derive that differentiation from a report by um, uh, the earliest one, I think what dates back to 1998, Chuck Lander and uh, Robert Kellogg from the NRCS had a comprehensive assessment of countywide uh, manure nutrients across the USA. And they developed a system where they estimated the recoverability of the manure, meaning what fraction of the manure excreted from the various fractions of cattle, of swine, of poultry, is actually loaded onto a manure spreader and taken to the field, as opposed to being deposited in an area where it's simply accumulating or on a pasture. So uh, anything excreted on pasture is not ex included. They also have beyond that loss coefficients from the moment it's excreted to storage in the barn, to the storage in out, outside the barn, um, all those losses are also deducted with a net effect. You see across North America, the bulk of the manure comes from cattle and a lot of cattle are grazed at some point. Um, and a lot of that manure is considered non-recoverable. So the net effect across North America is that when I present for nitrogen, the recoverable manure nitrogen is really only about a quarter of what's excreted. And the recoverable manure phosphorus is about a half of what's excreted. Um, those, um, if you use other uh, systems, the FAO also has a system that uh, makes a differentiation between uh, what's applied to land and what's excreted. Theirs uh, are, result in a higher fraction being applied to land. Um, but in both instances, if you talk to the people who made the estimates, they say, yeah, they're, they're not very precise. So what's the fate of those other nutrients? The, some of those other nutrients are um, utilized by pasture. Uh, it's very hard when you're doing a nutrient balance to get accurate estimates of the acreage and the productivity and the number of cattle on pastures. So it's very hard to include them in the nutrient balance. So that's one of the reasons the fertilizer industry tends to focus on arable land, crop land, because that's where most of our fertilizers are going. And so what we're striving for is figures on you know, what's actually applied there. Other questions? So I've got a question, Tom. Um, I was really interested in the um, uh, trajectories of the crop phosphorus balances that you showed um, for Western Europe and, and the USA. And one of the things that, that um, really um, jumped out at me was that the crop um, phosphorus removal in the US um, 
has continued to go up, whereas the um, crop removal in Western Europe from the 1990s really has, has plateaued off. And I was wondering, um, you know, clearly the um, phosphorus application has gone down in Western Europe. But is that an indication um, that uh, the removal efficiency isn't so good in terms of the, the crop breeds that are being used or, or lower yields? What, what's driving that big change between Western Europe and the USA? Well, th thanks, Helen. That's a brilliant observation. And that's something, of course, that was one of the first things I noted in the data set. And if you look at the publication, we do strongly point it out there as well. Um, the crop, uh, crop productivity yield per acre continues to increase across North America. Um, it seems to be have reached a plateau in Western Europe. Um, Western Europe, of course, just like North America, is very highly productive agriculture, very high yields compared to the rest of the world. But for at least the last two decades, we haven't seen any improvement in Western Europe. And in my interactions with our agronomic scientists, a lot of Western Europe, Europeans just assume that they have hit plateau, they have enough food, and now they're focused on the environment. Uh, North America still does have, I would have to say, uh, a mentality of we produce the food that feeds the world and, uh, and continues to be you know, like somewhat a, a net exporter of bulk commodities. Uh, I think, uh, you know, what's the right strategy uh, is partly a, a function of people's value judgments to some degree, but at the same time, um, if we want to uh, meet the projected needs for the world by 2050, um, I still see continued increase being part of sustainability. If we, if we, are, if we are failing to increase crop productivity, we're going to see a world in which um, people's livelihoods are going to be negatively affected. And I don't think that's good for sustainability either. So uh, I think it's an important point and it's an important question to raise as to why. Um, there are uh, crop scientists as well who point out that we, we may have hit some yield plateaus and uh, calling for an infusion of a new round of, uh, of research on focused on the intensification part of sustainable intensification. Thank you. And I enjoyed your presentation. That was great. Well, thank you, Helen. <clears throat> could, it, could it be that there's more uh, genetically manipulated crops being used in North America? I can't say the exact role of genetic modifications, Philippe, but um, I think there is, uh, to some degree, it has played some um, uh, role in the productivity of North America, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the context. We have to recognize that North America is a highly mechanized agriculture as well, with farmers now covering much larger farms than they did in the past. And uh, GMOs, uh, particularly herbicide tolerance, um, and, um, and the insect resistance have both contributed to making crops easier to manage on a large scale. <clears throat> well, nowadays, if you go to a supermarket in France, half of the food is organic, organic, organic. So there might be also changes, that type of change taking place. Yep. And if you compare the European field to fork strategy to uh, strategies for agriculture in North America, mm -hmm. I, I think you'll see quite a difference as well. <clears throat> yeah. Interesting. Tom, I had another uh, question um, to, uh, so, so you mentioned about linking the soil test P data with the nutrient use data and also with the fertilizer use data set. So is that something um, plant nutrition is doing or would there be interest in doing something like that to kind of get at the linkages between how much nutrient comes at, at, a, at a relatively macro scale versus what are the soil test P values versus the fertilizer use data sets? Uh, certainly we do uh, see uh, linking those because, you know, I, I think the pro you can't interpret a nutrient balance with the, for phosphorus particularly without looking at the soil. You know, you may have a huge surplus of phosphorus going into agriculture at some point, but if the soil test levels are very low, that's probably appropriate. You can have a huge phosphorus uh, deficient, you know, um, a deficiency in phosphorus applications, um, 
But if the soil tests are extremely high, that's not necessarily a threat to productivity uh, either. So right. I think it's, uh, it's in the interpretation step where you relate the nutrient balances to the soil test levels. And this is, I'll reach out to you. This is one place that I, uh, it would be cool to talk about possible collaborations. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. Very interested in that. <clears throat> Before we continue, uh, if there are more questions, I just want to check in with you, Tom, because we said this was going to be an hour. <laughs> and I want to be respectful of your time. It does seem like maybe there might be some quite more questions. Do you have a little bit more time or what, what time do you need to go? Um, I have a hard stop at 4.10 because I promised to call somebody by then, so. <clears throat> fair enough, fair That's enough. Good. So if anyone has last minute questions, uh, dive in now. <laughs> Okay, I think we are students. There's a lot of students that are very quiet students on the... Thank I've you so much for the Tom. Yes, thank you, Tom. That was uh, a great chat. I was wondering, um, is that 2020 uh, soil test available right now on the... I was hoping to be able to say yes, Mel, but um, oh, okay. <laughs> just this week we discovered a few little things, okay. uh, but... I... <clears throat> I'm hopeful by I'll, I'll, April 1, if you go to okay. that URL, you will see the 2020 data. <clears throat> I, will, I will eagerly anticipate seeing it. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, well, if no one's jumping in, I'm gonna have to end this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, Tom. Um, it was really, really helpful. Uh, I also just wanna, once again, maybe a few people jumped on later, remind you that uh, we've got Mel giving a presentation on April 30th at 11 a.m. Eastern time and Sandy, George, and Ram will be presenting on April 14th. So uh, please uh, join us for a continuation of these types of conversations. Thank you, Nancy, for involving me in this. And I look forward to the day when I can meet uh, a lot of the uh, people who would have, what I would have seen in person. <clears throat> yes. Since really, I am only 30 kilometers away from Waterloo. <clears throat> yeah, we'll be able to do this in person one day, no. yes. right at the yeah. end of the tunnel. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much again, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you Thanks next so time. Thanks so much. Thank you now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.